Chapter 2 Proto Flipping the wielding goggles up to get a better view of his patchwork, Tubbo huffs and chews on his lower lip, not super happy with the way he's sealed this section of the hole shut. He reaches behind him to grab the pry bar, but stops when a waspish voice snaps. You've repaired that section twice now. Stop it. But it looks hideous. I almost got it perfect. Tubbo's in the middle of saying when he's bowled over by Ronbu yelling. I don't care if it's perfect. It just needs to get us off this void-cursed rock. It's my ship. I'll fix it how I fucking want. Tubbo fires back twisting to glare over his shoulder at where Ronbu is sprawled out in the shade of the open cargo bay, looking utterly miserable in only his pants and an ill-fitting tank from Tubbo. He rolls his lips back to bare his fangs, but apparently doesn't have the energy for anything more, tips his head to the side, and heaves out a huge breath, tail limply coiled over one of his legs. A rush of genuine sympathy sweeps through Tubbo, and he turns back around with a sigh, looks at his less-than-stellar patch job, and it kills him to leave it looking like that. But it'll survive a jump to light speed, and he forces himself to move on, snapping the goggles down once more. They've been stuck on this planetoid for almost three Imperial cycles now, with no way to get any communications out. Some combination of all the radiation and just general damages has the deep space transmitter down, making it so Tubbo can't send out an SOS, has to resort to repairing the Asachi himself. He started working on it as soon as his legs could bear his weight, but with all the residual radiation and energy pouring off Osiren, Tubbo's a little limited on time. The day cycles here are impossibly bright and deadly, swelling with heat that threatens to cook anything that steps out from under cover so he can't start repairs until the planetoid has rotated away from Osiren, temperature leveling out to something more... survivable. It's still miserable work, even at night, the welding equipment heating up the already hot air around him to the point that Tubbo's just out there in a tank top and cargo pants, bare feet slipping against the slick hull of the Asachi. He puts on the protective gloves because he doesn't want to burn his fingertips off, that it's too hot for anything else, leaves his arms exposed to the jumping sparks that fly off the welding torch. Tubbo just grits his teeth and bowls his way through it, rubs burn cream into his splotchy red skin as soon as Osiren starts to rise, and he's forced to take shelter in the oven the Asachi basically becomes. He doesn't want to waste their fuel running the engines enough so that the aircon will work, leaves the cargo bay wide open, and hopes a breeze will make its way inside, where they rest up against the walls in the sticky shade. But no matter how sweaty and uncomfortable Tubbo is, he's learned it's five times worse for Ronbu, who practically melts into a puddle as soon as the sun comes up, strips down as much as his dignity will allow, and basically passes out from heat exhaustion until night sets in. At first, Tubbo chalked it up to him being a spoiled brat and attempting to weasel out of helping repair the ship. But after Ronbu literally collapsed on his feet, trying to bring some tools up to Tubbo, he realized he might not be playing up how bad he was feeling. What are you- Oh shit! Tubbo shouted, watching Ronbu's lanky form slip off the side of the ship like a marionette with its strings cut, a distressingly heavy thud following as he presumably hit the ground. Scrambling to his feet, Tubbo took a running leap off the Asachi, wings buzzing behind him and softening his landing in the sand beside Ronbu's prone body. Checking him over quickly, Tubbo was relieved to find he wasn't bleeding and hadn't broken anything, but it looked like he was out cold. Couldn't even really tell if he was breathing. Tubbo felt wildly around for a pulse and eventually found it high in Ronbu's neck, beating erratically under a long ear. Only problem was, Tubbo didn't know if that was normal or not. There weren't many Ender in the Imperial fleet, definitely none in his old cohort, and Tubbo only knew what the resting pulse was for, like, three other species. He didn't know jack shit about Ender physiology. You better not die, you st-
stupid jackass. Tebo muttered under his breath, another hand flitting down to feel Ronbu's forehead, skin warm to the touch, but not sweaty in the slightest. Was that a bad thing? A good thing? Fuck, he didn't know. He'd never even touched Ronbu before. Queens knew what his normal body temperature was supposed to be. But Tebo had to do something. Fucker just collapsed dead on his feet, and that was obviously not ideal. Halting a surprisingly light Ronbu into his arms, Tebo carted him inside the cargo bay and spread him out on the floor, attempting to be careful as he set him down. Ronbu was at least still breathing, chest rising and falling shallowly, and Tebo flopped down next to him, chewing on a thumb and trying to think of everything he knew about Ender. They were stupid tall, and stupid rich, had some sort of problem with water, could teleport short distances and see relatively well in low light, which probably helped them out a bunch since their planet was a sad, frozen little rock at the very edges of their system, hardly got any luck. Oh shit, that was it. Anwil was frigid, probably never got much warmer than above freezing, and where Tubbo had been slowly getting frostbite standing outside in his full gear, the Ender were all walking around in relatively light-looking fabrics, completely unbothered. Rambu's got fucking heat stroke or something, and Tebo immediately yanked his boots off, fingers working quick to unbutton his long-sleeved tunic, exposing as much of his skin to the air as he could in the hopes it'd cool him off. But it's nowhere near close to freezing, with something more like 26 degrees in here. Fuck! Fuck! Tebo stammered, wrapping his hands nervously against the floor, trying to come up with some solution that didn't involve using up what fuel they had, finally lands on something. Spinning around so his back was to Ronbu, Tebo paused for half a second, feeling like an idiot, but he couldn't think of anything better with no power to lower the temperature, slowly began fanning his wings to create a breeze. The movement pulled at his blaster wound aggravating already tender muscles and tissues. But Tubbo didn't have a lot of options here, and he'd rather tear his side back open than get stuck on this dusty rock with no fuel after running the aircon trying to cool Ronbu off. Queens, he might have to, though, if this doesn't work. And Tubbo may not like the guy, but he sure as hell wasn't going to let him lay there and have his brains be cooked alive. No one deserved that. Not even snotty, spoiled Ender Princes. But thankfully... After a few minutes, he heard groaning behind him and looked over his shoulder to find Ronbu stirring, bringing a shaking hand up to rub at his face, eyes slitting open in the gloom and glowing vibrantly. After that, Tebo didn't ask Ronbu to help with any repairs, just offered him a tank top that was ridiculously short on him, and left him to stew in the hold while Tebo tried his damnedest to fix the Asachi as fast as possible but still to a standard he was happy with. As the souls drag on, though, Tebo thinks he might have to concede on the repair work being as good as he'd like, both of them getting increasingly more exhausted and waspish in the oppressive heat. And if it was just Tubbo out here, he'd suffer through whatever to take care of the Asachi like he wants. But it's not just him. He has to factor Ronbu into this. Osiren is threatening at the horizon when Tubbo calls it for the night. Day, technically, whatever. Hauls his equipment under the Asachi and drags leaden feet up the cargo ramp. Stumbles past Ronbu, who honestly looks as wretched as some things he's seen dying of terminal illnesses. He's not drenched in sweat like Tubbo. Apparently Ender missed that in the Lotto Wheel of Life. But his skin's gone weirdly ashy dry and cracked around his knuckles and the edges of his mouth, eyes dull whenever they're actually open, clear fatigue on his face, and it does stupid things to Tubbo's exhausted brain. Sorry, it's... the repair's taken so long. He mumbles absent-mindedly, really, truly feeling bad for the bastard as he slides down a wall that's a disturbing amount of warm already. And Rambu's tail flicks, only sign that he's still alive as he snips half-heartedly. You should be. Piss off. Tebo slurs without any real bite. Doesn't have the energy to actually be angry, 
kicks his legs out, and nods his head to the side. Hopes he'll get a few decent hours of sleep before it gets too hot even for that. He's not sure how long it's quiet for, drifting off into hazy half-consciousness, so he isn't even sure that he's really hearing it when Rambu mumbles. I... that's... unfair of me, you... you saved my life. It's the first decent thing that's ever come out of his mouth. And Tubbo's half-awake mind is convinced he made it up. But then there's this awful, too real, hollow laughter echoing around the cargo hold. Well, you did what you had to to survive. I was just there. What do you mean? Tubbo thinks, he says, head still a little fuzzy around the edges, but he's starting to wake up some especially when Ranbu hums in long, drawn-out sounds. You didn't do it for me. No one does. I'm not even there. Tebo sits up a little, blinking the wavy lines of sleep out of his eyes, and stares at where Ranbu is laying, facing away from him. And he hasn't moved much, but his arms are snaked tight around his torso, like he's trying to keep something from escaping. There's... Nothing there. A shadow on the wall. Doesn't matter. Never did. Whatever he's talking about gets lost as he presumably slips into speaking Ender. The sounds long and low, like distorted echoes you hear at the edge of madness. And Tubbo furrows his brow, kind of concerned about the heat getting to him. Uh, y you good, man? I, sorry, I don't really know what you're talking about. Rambu's body jerks in breathy laughter, his reply whisper quiet and muddled with sleep. Nothing. It's nothing. But with the way he's holding on to himself, claws digging into the bare skin of his arms like they're going to draw blood, only slackening as he passes out from the rising heat, Tubbo gets the feeling it's not nothing. Hey, your highness... Prince Rambu? Hey! Ukhead! Tubbo yells, trying to get Rambu's attention, but he doesn't stir, chest rising unevenly under his arms, and Tubbo thuds his head back against the bulkhead, mentally runs through a list of everything else he wants to fix before taking off, and slashes it in half. With those concessions, he's able to get them off this hell hole before the next sunrise but they're going to have to make a stop at the closest port town to find a replacement for the deep space transmitter. Tebo hopes Ranbu won't be too pissed at the further delay in their trip. Guy seemed pretty high-strung about school, if he remembers right. The new term started yesterday, so he's already missed some of his classes. The new transmitter is not optional, though. Tebo doesn't care if Ranbu throws the biggest bitch fit in existence, he's getting the damn replacement equipment even if he has to drag Ranbu along with him, kicking and screaming. It's been three Imperial cycles since Tommy's heard from him, and it makes his heart squeeze painfully just thinking about what he must be feeling. The two of them have always been close, roomed together their first year and bonded instantly, like only first years do, in the face of all the staggering bullshit they're put through. But even after Tubbo left, thought he'd never hear from Tommy again, was surprised, and probably shouldn't have been, when Tommy kept messaging him through... through anything. They call each other best friend, but Tubbo knows they both mean it to be something more like brother. So that's why getting a new transmitter isn't optional. Because the last Tommy heard from him, Tubbo was flying past a star going supernova, and has received radio silence since. It'll be okay, he thinks, wrapping his arms around himself, even though it's hot. But it provides some grounding comfort, has him sleepily thinking about speckled wings. You'll get the parts, and it'll be okay. Tommy will be okay because you're okay, and everything will be fine. New game plan in mind. Tubbo settles down to try and actually get some shut-eye. Dozes on and off through the hottest parts of the day haunted by fever dreams of fuel canisters and lit matches burning like supernovas. And whenever he wakes up for a brief second, makes sure that Ronbu is still breathing before drifting off again. 
Tubbo is up for good, once it doesn't hurt to look outside and the air isn't scorching to breathe. Pops his back and winces at the way his blaster wound twinges. Pulls up his, frankly, disgusting tank to check on it, and frowns when he peels the med patch back. It's always been ugly. Keeps getting uglier the longer it takes to heal. But the edges are starting to look weird. Going a livid shade of red that smacks of infection. And Tebo's breath hitches, shakily tapping the patch back down for now. It's going to be okay, though. It's fine. It doesn't really look that bad. He's just overthinking anyway. And wherever they stop for the transmitter, we'll have a halfway decent apothecary anyway. It's going to be fine. There's nothing he can do about it now, though. So he puts it out of his mind and struggles to his feet, goes about fixing their dinner. It's real fine dining on the Asachi without the portable replicator working. And Tubbo grabs a packet of nectar for himself and a dehydrated block of something for Ronbu. Walks over to where Ronbu's still passed out and nudges him gently with his toes. Hey, Princey boy, time for another five-star meal. Ronbu's face scrunches up at the touch, and not in a ugh-I-don't-want-to-wake-up way, but in a that-really-tickles way. And now is so not the time? But Tubbo can't help himself, shifting his toes a little further and wiggling them into Ronbu's side. The noise he makes in protest is absolutely bizarre, high-pitched and warbling, rumbles out of his chest like a startled house cat as he twists away from Tubbo's touch. It's so unexpected that Tubbo can't help laughing, hunches over with how hard he's wheezing, and Rambu turns to glare daggers over his shoulder, which only sends Tubbo further into hysterics. Because with his slitted eyes and flicked back ears, now he looks like a disgruntled house cat. I... that's... I just... what? Tubbo stammers around his giggles, forgotten packet of food dangling from one hand, and Rambu snatches it from him, elegantly ripping the plastic open with an easy swipe of his claws, the look in his narrowed eyes screaming, This could be you. Tubbo sincerely doubts it, confident he could take him in a fight, despite the height advantage and whole claw and fang situation rolls his eyes with a snort, and heads to the edge of the cargo ramp. It may still be hot, but the air is considerably fresher out here than in the hold, and Tubbo flops down with a light wince, crosses his legs together while he drinks his nectar. He's lost in thought about everything he's got to get done before Osiren rises again, so it really catches Tubbo off guard when there's movement next to him and he snaps his head to the side to see Ronbu folding himself down a good distance away, but still parallel to Tubbo, eyes trained on the sky with a sort of soft contemplation. It's weird for Tubbo to see him out of his royal getup, no end crystals glittering in the night or flashing in his dark hair, divested of all his pomp and glamour, and he tries not to stare too much. But it's like some barrier is starting to come down in Tubbo's mind against his will. Because like this, disheveled and haggard, no shoes on, one of Tubbo's ratty tanks on his back, and only some of his jewelry, Rambu looks almost normal, like he could be any other member of the syndicate stuck out here with Tubbo. Resolutely pushing the thought from his mind, Tubbo aggressively drinks his nectar and tries not to think about Rambu in a grey and orange bomber as the Andirian tips his head to the side naked awe glowing in the depths of his crimson eye while he stares at the stars. Wow. It's really beautiful, even if it did almost kill us. Grateful for the distraction, Tebo turns to look up at the sky himself, the darkness of night interrupted by huge clouds of red-orange gases that swirl and spit with their own light, the last remaining bands of fiery power that Osiren discharged. It's interesting, maybe, but not the best Tubbo's seen. And he shrugs his shoulders, mumbles around the plastic straw to his nectar pouch. Eh, it's all right. The Ryish and Nebula is like half this size, but way more vibrant. What? You've seen the Ryoshan Nebula? Rambu asks, incredulous. And Tubbo looks over at him, 
a little surprised to see him staring back with wide eyes. Nothing in them but open honesty and unbridled enthusiasm. And Tubbo says slowly, Yeah, I fly past it all the time on my way home. What's it like? Like, is it as impressive as the hollows make it out to be? And have you ever seen the micro pseudo stars? They're supposed to be some of the rarest phenomena in the galaxy. Rambu rambles in clear excitement, ears perked all the way up and quivering slightly. And Tubbo just blinks at him, feels like he's seeing an entirely new person, begins a little hesitantly. Um, yeah, it, it's really impressive, uh, very red. And I think I've seen the, uh, micro things. They move around a lot, so that's probably why most people have never seen them. Ronbu makes a trilling sound at the back of his throat, wiggling up straighter as his tail flops around happily. Oh, that's amazing. That's just... Oh, oh! H have you ever seen the Delenium Cluster? Or the Triplet Suns of Zaxxon Four? Del... Delenium... Oh, you mean the Bolsa... Tubbo cuts off what he was saying with a violent cough, afraid of ruining the childlike wonder on Ronbu's face. And he doesn't know where it came from, but he's suddenly loathed to the idea of it going. Y yeah, I've seen the, um, the Delenium Cluster. It is uh, not all it's cracked up to be. Zaxxon's sons are, though. Queens, I've never seen a more amazing sunset in my life. Really? Rambu hushes, hands all wrapped up together in his lap, like if he behaves himself. Tubbo will keep talking. Seems like he can't help it, though, as he leans forward and gushes. Tell me more. And for some reason, Tubbo does. Detailing out all the places he's been and the things he's seen. Talks about cutting his engines and cruising through nebula the size of planets. Watching the billowing gases sweep up and over the Asachi, swirling together in brief bursts of light before breaking back apart. Like being at the heart of a living, moving, breathing painting. He tells him about skating as close as you can get to the black hole at the center of Andromeda, how light bends and warps around it like massive waves, curling back into itself and contorting like nothing on this plane has any right to do, the sheer amount of power radiating out of it making his antenna tingle for what felt like days after. He gets so swept up in talking, Tebo says things he's never told another soul before, worried they'd think he's lost his mind. But that fear isn't here right now. And Tubbo talks about the humming song he can hear out in deep space sometimes, in the dark black of nothingness, where the closest stars are a bare prick on the horizon. Talks about the figures he's seen dancing in the icy trails of comets, hands larger than stars carting through nebula. Rambu doesn't say one word the entire time, sits with his knobby knees folded up to his chin, tail twitching and vibrating next to him while he listens in rapt fascination. Eyes never leaving Tubbo's face, and there's something in their glowing depths that makes Tubbo falter a bit in one of his stories. He knows that look, recognizes it almost immediately because he's seen it before, staring back at him in mirrors, sparking and alive like coiling solar flares. It's the desire to go to see and explore, a hunger for wide-open star fields and nothing holding you back. It's how he feels when he wraps his hand around the Asachi's controls, heart thundering under his ribs and the whole universe at his fingertips. He's like me, Tebo thinks, in abject confusion, voice trailing off because he doesn't know what else to say, shaky inhales getting stuck somewhere in his windpipe, Queens, he feels it too. Somehow, some way, we're the same in this. Incredible. Rambu breathes, the first thing he's said in a while, hunches over and props his chin up on his knees, a sweet, hesitant looking smile twitching his cracked lips up. I. just. wow. I've read so much, but you've seen an. I just really appreciate you sharing your stories with me, Tubbo. 
It's the first time Rambu's ever said his name. And he does so very cautiously, like he's afraid he's doing it wrong. Almost looks scared where he's sitting across from Tubbo. Ears flicked down low in subconscious mannerisms Tubbo is finally learning to read. He's such a bizarre combination of a person. Scathing attitude and horrific brattiness, alongside an unanticipated hesitance. Meek shyness, like he's not really sure how to have a normal conversation. Yeah. Yeah, no problem. Tubbo says slowly, but genuinely. And as some of the tension seems to ease out of Ranbu, ears perking back up, he realizes he doesn't actually know anything about him. Asks a bit impulsively, Is that what you're, um, studying? At the academy, I mean. I... what? Rambu asks, tipping his head to the side, and Tubbo winces. Knew it sounded stupid and confusing coming out of his mouth, so he tries again. Are you, like, an ecology major or something? Or astrophysics? I don't know, just something to do with galactic phenomena. Uh, oh... Uh, no, I'm, uh, I'm an intergalactic affairs major. Rambu admits, with what sounds like reluctance, and Tubbo doesn't blame him. He never studied it personally, but he knew the IA program had a rap for being one of the driest, most convoluted, headache-inducing subjects at the academy. And he wrinkles his nose just thinking about it. Rambu snapping quickly. What? What's that face for? Huh? Oh, nothing. It, it just just sounds really boring, you know? And I thought that you'd... Tubbo trails off because Ronbu was looking at him weird. Probably thinking it's odd for Tubbo to weigh in on his personal life when they are anything but friends. And he sighs. I don't know, it just seems like... Wouldn't you rather be out there than stuck behind some desk? He's seen it a couple of times before now. Ronbu just going absolutely still any expression he had dropping away into blank nothingness, like he's some robot playing at being a living thing. And Tubbo watches it happen now, his tail freezing by his side, that distant apathy shuddering fast over his eyes. It's absolutely haunting. Huh. What a ridiculous thing to say. Why would you... Ah, I bet the heat is getting to you by now, too, which I'm not surprised. You've spent so much time fixing the ship, I'm sure you're exhausted. Rambu says smoothly, but it doesn't sound right. Like he's not actually present while he says it. This ordeal has been tough on you, I understand that. When we get to Nerox, I'll speak with my father about increasing your payment, would that be acceptable? Uh, I mean, yeah, if you're sure, but... Tebo tries, but he's quickly cut off by Rambu interrupting fluidly. Consider it done. It's the least I can do in thanks for your services, which are quite extraordinary, if I may say so. I'm curious, but if you don't mind my asking, where did you learn to pilot? I, well, mostly just experience. I mean, I have some formal training, but why are you... You were a cadet, weren't you? Tebo chokes on whatever he was trying to say. Pulse ratcheting up briefly, just hearing the word. Thoughts scrambled in a hundred directions as he stares at Ronbu. And the prince inclines his head, says swiftly to his unasked question of how. You still make your bunks the way the Navy does. The baseline for most of your flight maneuvers is classic Imperial doctrine, and you probably don't realize it. But whenever you stand still, you do it in parade rest. It hits like a punch to the gut, and Tubbo woodenly turns away hands starting to tremor with the knowledge of how much of them is still in him. He thought he'd gotten rid of all of it, stripped it down and thrown it away, but it's apparently still there, like a scar he's never going to be rid of. And Tubbo's breath hitches, feels like walls are closing in around him, and he scrambles to his feet, needs to move, otherwise he'll never shake the feeling of being trapped. I... I have a lot of them. Um, lot of work to do, so... He jerks his thumb to where the welding equipment is tucked under the Asachi, backing away like Ronbu's holding him at blaster point, and he's one misstep away from pulling the trigger. Of course, take your time, Ronbu says evenly, 
rising to his feet without a twitch from his tail or his face. And that's all the dismissal Tubbo needs. Heart jackhammering in his chest as soon as he thinks it. The fact that he's still looking to be dismissed on some level, shaking him to his core. You're not there. You're not there. You're not there. Tubbo repeats to himself, over and over again, trying to get his hands to stop shaking while he patches the few remaining holes, shoves out everything that's not fixing the Asachi, and takes in even breaths. You're out. It's fine. You're okay. You're free. But it doesn't feel like he is. And Tubbo stares down at his bare wrists later, nicked and burned from some wayward sparks. And there's nothing there but he swears he sees a faint shimmering of gold out of the corner of his eyes. An excerpt from the Declassified Galactic Survival Guide Briefly talked about in earlier sections, but in dire need to be expanded upon, is the celestial snowball that put on airs and decided to be its own planet, otherwise known as Anwil, home of the End Crystal and the Ender. Located a very unsensible distance from anything of major import, Anwil was largely considered to be a galactic waste for many long eons. But as soon as some off-their-rocker Neroxan imperialized scientist put an end crystal in a short fusion reactor and created an explosion that leveled half their facility, Anwil was now suddenly much more interesting. The ensuing interest in Anwil and subsequent fallout could be likened to the phenomena of that one unpopular girl in your school who abruptly becomes popular for some superficial reason, and then proceeds to transcend entirely into peak mean girl status. With the Sun Empire fully focused on getting their greedy little hands on as many int crystals as possible, the Andirian king at the time took it upon himself to forge a relationship of scarily dependent consumerism basically making Anwil the high-roller drug dealer to the horrifically crippled Neroxan Empire. Since the Sun Empire's main goal is continued galactic expansion, and with end crystals powering their cruisers, it significantly cut down on fuel costs, which led to the construction of more ships that needed their own end crystals, ballooning out of control until we have the, frankly, concerning fleet we have today. And naturally, all of this made Anwil stupid wealthy. Being essentially the arms dealer for the largest empire in the galaxy comes with its perks. Extended influence and reach. A solid stream of income from a market that will never die. Unprecedented control and favoritism in the Imperial Senate. But as always, there are drawbacks. The chief ones being, namely the forever widening prosperity margin amongst Anwil's social classes. But the only ones that care about that are the disparaged, and they're out of luck. But the other is nestled right at the glittering heart of Voidfall Palace. Because what do you think happens when you stick a bunch of Ender together who have never known the meaning of no, and massive amounts of credits are involved? And what exactly am I supposed to do with this? Ranbu snips, disdainfully holding the blaster out as far from him as he can, the very tips of his claws hanging onto the grip gingerly like it's going to explode in his hands. Which is completely unwarranted. Tubbo specifically gave him the one that's least likely to explode. Huffs and points sarcastically at it. Point that end at someone, pull the trigger, and they stop moving. I know how a blaster works, Rambu seethes petulantly, stretching out into one long line of aggravation as his tail lashes around behind his legs. I just don't know what you want me to do with it. Point that end at- Ugh! End you are insufferable, Rambu cries, throwing his free hand in the air, and Tubbo can't help grinning. Always likes it when he can get him worked up enough that he emotes properly dropping the facade of aloof, uncaring royal for just a second. They're currently docked at the port of Immuna, the closest planet that would most likely have the parts Tubbo needed to fix the transmitter. And it was a surprisingly easy flight, not just in terms of nothing catastrophic happening, but in the fact that Ronbu didn't complain at all. 
When Tubbo told him what they were doing, once they got out of the planetoid's atmosphere, Rambu had sounded like he couldn't care less, telling Tubbo to do as he pleased. But Tubbo didn't put any stock in his tone of voice, watched out of the corner of his eye as Rambu's tail quivered faintly, saw how perked up his ears were. He was excited about going to Immuna, and Tubbo had to bite his lip to keep from smiling, proud he'd finally learned how to read the cagey little fucker. Rambu watched, wide-eyed, as the black of space dissolved into the blinding light of hyperspace, made an interested little noise in the back of his throat, and Tubbo had the sudden and impulsive desire to show Ronbu some of the things he'd been rambling about the other day. Unfortunately, there wasn't anything super interesting that Tubbo knew of between where they were and where they were going. So they'd be in hyperspace for the entire trip. But it didn't end up mattering much. Rambu stayed curled up in the co-pilot chair, even after they jumped to light speed, twisted to face Tubbo and peppered him with questions about his travels that grew longer and more yawn-filled as he began to nod off in the relieving chill of the Asachi, eventually falling asleep a few hours in. Tubbo hadn't said anything about him sitting in the co-pilot spot when they took off, because he figured Rambu would go back to the sleeping quarters after they jumped, and when he hadn't, Tubbo was going to say something. But then he had to fall asleep, and Tubbo didn't want to wake him up, not when he was so clearly exhausted. It was good that he was getting some actual restful sleep anyway. Looked completely dead to the world whenever Tubbo would check on him. But it was really quiet in the Asachi without all his questions taking up space. And Tubbo liked feeling his engines humming in the air again, but it was just... a little quiet is all. Ronbu woke up with a jerk as soon as Tubbo began entering Immuna's atmosphere, the jolt of re-entry probably just startling him, and Tubbo gave him a quick smile to let him know everything was okay before turning back to his controls, easing them down towards Tignarth's station, figuring it was easy going here on out. And that's when the trouble began. Because Tignarth was not a nice spaceport, and while Tubbo would blend in just fine, covered in space grime and with his syndicate jacket on his back, he wouldn't turn any heads, but Ronbu? Stupid seven-foot-tall idiot covered in gold and end crystals? Would. And, apparently, he did not own any normal clothes. Why does every fucking thing have gold on it or some shit? Tubbo yelled, flinging glittering and very expensive-looking clothes all over the place while Ronbu bitched behind him. Uh, it's called a refined sense of style, you space hobo. Well, you're a space pimp because this is ridiculous. Queens, one shirt without filigree on it. Was that too much to ask for? And finally, at the bottom of the chest, Tebo finds some soft and too clean looking white shirts that'll do. Hurls one at Ronbu's stupid head. Here, just put that on and take off the rest of your jewelry and we should be fine. But Ronbu, for some reason seemed to lack a shred of common sense, and just held the shirt out incredulously, snapping. Um, no. This is a night shirt. I'm not going out in public in my sleep clothes. Wear the damn shirt, or queens help me. No, it's undignified, and I'll I'm trying to keep us from getting mugged. Which led to another argument that ended with Tubbo realizing Ronbu probably needed a blaster. And now, here they are. Ronbu glaring at him while he mistrustfully tries to buckle on the holster Tubbo gave him. He's doing such a bad job at it. Claws slipping over metal buckles. Can't seem to figure out how it's supposed to rest on his waist. That Tubbo rolls his eyes and goes to help him. You're such a baby. He sighs, easily prying the holster straps from Ronbu's long fingers and slinging it around his waist much more comfortably. Gets it fitted into place a lot quicker. Ronbu muttering above him. I am an adult. Tubbo snorts, and unthinkingly swats him lightly on the hip. Nope, guaranteed certifiable big-ass baby over here. Can't even do up his own holster. His eyes go wide as soon as he does it, just now registering who he's messing around with. Looks up at Ronbu with the full expectation that he's going to get bitched out. Ronbu's expression is complicated. Brows drawn down low and scrunching his eyes up. Mouth slightly parted, like he wants to say something, but can't get it out. They're standing close. 
Tabo didn't realize how close until Rambu takes one quick step back, and he doesn't have to crane his neck to look up at him. Shuffles back himself, because what's going on with him? Teasing Rambu and slapping at him playfully like they're close or something. They're barely on polite speaking terms, let alone friends. And Tubbo's quick to clear his throat, spinning on his heel to go open the cargo bay. Stops when he hears a soft... Um... Is it... it um... Where... I'm going to be safe out there, right? Tubbo looks over his shoulder at Ronbu, standing there twiddling his fingers together in his nightshirt and plain slacks, weather beat holster at his side and nothing hanging from his ears. But still, there's something about him that screams easy mark to Tubbo's well-trained eyes. But he's not about to tell him that. Yeah, don't worry, you'll be fine, Tubbo says as reassuringly as he can, turns around to release the cargo bay's doors. Tignarth isn't the nicest port, but it's not the worst. Promise. I've only been shot at two, no, three times here, and most of them were my fault. Wow, what a ringing endorsement. His voice is so dry and scathing that it makes surprised laughter bark out of Tubbo. Though it quickly turns into a pained hiss as his jumping diaphragm aggravates his blaster wound. And Tubbo rubs at it absentmindedly as he goes back over to Ronbu's side. It'll be okay. You've got me with you. Fantastic. Ronbu sighs in deadpan. But Tubbo feels a soft swish against one of his wings. The briefest touch from Ronbu's tail, like he's trying to reassure himself that Tubbo is there. That someone's next to him. And Tubbo smiles a little involuntarily. Sticks close as the cargo hold grinds open. Immuna is just as dry and sandy as the planetoid they got stuck on, which Tubbo is now lovingly referring to privately as Satan's ass crack. But it's a lot cooler here, situated out far enough from its own sun that Tubbo has to zip up his bomber when a chilly breeze rushes past. Next to him, though, Ronbu unwinds considerably, tipping his head up and letting the wind ruffle his dusty hair a deep noise of satisfaction rumbling out of his chest. Tebo feels tension ease out of him that he didn't know he'd been holding. Happy that Immuna is cold enough to not make Ronbu miserable, but that's not why he picked this planet. He buries his face in the collar of his jacket and tries to ignore the way his cheeks are burning, definitely not thinking about how he made sure to look up nearby planets' relative temperature readouts before deciding. No. Immuna was just close, and Tignarth wasn't as refuse-riddled as some other ports. And that was it, okay? He wasn't trying to be accommodating or whatever. I mean, he didn't want Rambu to die or anything, but his relative comfort was not Tubbo's concern. But as he leads them through the bustling streets of Tignarth, it becomes a harder and harder sell, because Rambu is really perking back up in the cooler temperature, sticking close to Tubbo's side as he whips his head around to look at everything. But Tubbo can feel his tail thudding into his wings every once in a while, and it makes him smile. Market stalls choke the street, striped canvas stretched tight over their roof and sides to provide some protection from the icy wind. Vendors hawking their wares in rough voices, cycling through a dozen different languages trying to catch someone's attention. And Tubbo knows most of them from his travels, but whenever they see him, they switch to Imperial Standard pretty quickly. Sera! Saras Fuka, you need munitions? Or unregistered blasters? Any credits accepted? Come take a look. Sera! He pretends like he can't hear them, and they lose interest fast, latching onto the next person that walks by as he leads Ronbu to where he remembers a reputable parts shop to be, ducks through the strings of shells and beads at the entrance, and calls out into the dusty space. Hello? One sec. A voice answers from somewhere else in the shop, so Tubbo pokes around for a minute, sifting through bins of loose scrap, finds a few coupling coils that look like they're in pretty good shape, and drops them on the counter already. Ronbu's head is swiveling around like an owl, taking in the racks of parts and the engine blocks hanging from the ceiling. Puzzled little frown on his face, and Tubbo points at the thing he's staring at. That's an intake manifold for a doxinide XR7. 
They don't make them anymore because they're some of the only ships that could outrun Imperial caravels. He doesn't really know why he says it. Maybe because he's bored. Or maybe because his head's starting to feel a little strange. Alternating, throbbing, and going fuzzy around the edges. It's probably nothing. Just a headache, blooming from the drastic change in temperature between Immuna and Satan's ass crack. It's not because of his wound. No. Definitely not. It's fine. He's totally fine. Weird feelings aside, Tabo's full-on expecting Ranbu to hum politely in response to his comment. Maybe say some textbook response like, oh, that's interesting. Like most everyone does. Not for him to turn to Tubbo and ask, honestly, what made them so fast? Well, usually for ship engines of that size, the fuel gets run through a few filters and regulators to make sure there's nothing in it. But the Sidaway are mad sons of bitches. Tubbo grins, making a shooting through motion with his hands as he says, They bypassed that completely and injected the fuel straight into the engine block. Made the docks and I fast as all shit, but they would catch fire occasionally. Huh. Is there not a way to get around that? It seems pretty useful. Rambu says, ears bobbing up and down in thought. And Tubbo leans up against the counter, talking animatedly with his hands while he explains. Right? But there's actually this problem with the piping, and the relative diameter cool steel can be forged into before it shatters apart under pressures exceeding a certain PSI. And... Usually, when he starts talking shop, unless it's another dedicated pilot or an engineer, he loses people pretty quickly. But Rambu keeps prodding him along with relevant questions, leaned back up against the counter as well, with his entire attention settled on Tubbo. It's a little unexpected. He's positive Ranbu has no idea what he's talking about for a good majority of his explanations. But he doesn't lose interest. Is actually starting to pick up some things by the time the shopkeeper makes an appearance. Hey, sorry about that. Got a slayer I'm trying to get up off the ground by Sanai today. Anyway, what can I do you for, Sfukin? The man says, wiping his hands clean on a rag, two long, thick whiskers hanging down by the sides of his mouth and Tubbo turns around to drape his arms on the countertop. My transmitter got damaged during a supernova eruption, and I'm looking for replacement parts. Yeah, no problem. Do you know what model- Hang on. You don't mean no siren, do you? The man says, whiskers twitching out as his eyebrows shoot up, and Tubbo cocks his head to the side, says a little smugly. Yep. Flew right through the initial debris field and made it out just as it went terminal. Stars above, you must be one hell of a pilot. The man whistles, and a hot streak of pride ignites down Tubbo's spine, feeling good to have his ego stroked like this. And then the shopkeeper cuts his eyes to the side, chuckles good-naturedly. You're lucky you've got such an amazing partner. Probably saves your inky hide a lot, hey? Tubbo blinks in confusion, until he realizes he's talking to Ronbu who would definitely take any assumed association between him and the syndicate, between him and Tubbo, as an insult. He coughs into his fist awkwardly and flexes his wings behind him, is quick to jump back on topic before Rambu can say something scathing and definitely rude. Uh, yeah, um, transmitter parts? Oh, right. Sorry, what model do you have? They get started talking, and figure out that the whole thing probably needs to be replaced. But thankfully, Josen, the shopkeeper, has a few to choose from on hand. And normally, Tubbo loves talking about the specs of parts, but his headache has really picked up, and he's finding it hard to follow the conversation. I can have some guys drop it off tomorrow if that's alright. What hang are you in? Josen asks, scribbling something down on a scrap of paper, and Tubbo sways a little where he stands suddenly light-headed to the point that his wings buzz behind him to keep him upright. Uh, um... He starts, tongue feeling slowed and heavy in his mouth. I... Uh... It's... F five? No. No, four. It's... Hangar four. <laughs> Queen, sorry. My head's really killing me. No worries, Fuka. We can settle up tomorrow, just go get some rest. Josen says, and tears a slip off that he passes over to some of Tubbo's fumbling hands. And yeah, he should go do that. He needs to go do that. But only one, uh, 
one little small problem. And that's Tubbo's not really sure how to get where he's supposed to go. There's a hesitant touch at his shoulder, and Tubbo swings wildly towards it, ends up staring at a swath of white fabric before he remembers, oh, you have to look up, and tips his head back to see Ronbu looking at him with a concerned tilt to his face. Are you okay? He asks, but his voice doesn't match up with how his mouth moves. Words already over before he's even finished shaping the sounds. And that's not good. Has Tubbo nodding a little more erratically than he means to. Y yeah, I just... I need some rest, I think. Okay. Okay, let's get back to the ship then. Rambu says in an odd tone. Turns his head to Josen, and it's weird not seeing all of his earrings swinging around with the movement, like he's missing some of his personal flair. Master Shopkeep, if you could have your men deliver the replacement after Sun High tomorrow, it would be greatly appreciated. I... we've had a very trying few cycles, and m my partner requires rest. Queen's past. We're trying to blend in, you overly formal idiot. Tubbo huffs going to swat at Rambu in reprimand and misses by a wide margin. Stares at the hand that missed like it's personally betrayed him. Feels like his brain's melting out of his ears a little bit, but jerks his head up when he hears, Tubbo, come on, let's go. They haven't been inside that long. Maybe an hour at most. And Tubbo knows Immuna's a little cold, but he doesn't remember it being sub-zero. As soon as they step outside... He has to lean back against the building, vertigo spinning through him at the icy slap to the face, field of vision swimming like the entire earth is undulating beneath his feet. His hands shake where they prop him up, and actually no, all of him is shaking, racked with spasms that make his teeth chatter and send his left side pulsating with pain. He reaches careful fingers down and prods at the med patch, like he's done a hundred times before. But now, even the slightest touch sends hot tendrils of aching discomfort shooting through his side, flaring up and out from the wound. Bringing a trembling hand up to the back of his neck, Tubbo wraps clammy fingers around burning hot skin, and swallows past the dryness in his throat tongue sticking to the roof of his mouth as he hears himself say, distantly, I... I think I might have an, an infection. You think you caught something? You do look paler than normal. Rambu mutters from his side, and then makes a low, echoing noise and nudges at Tubbo's shoulder. If you're not feeling well, you need to get some rest. Can you walk? Y yeah Tebo says with confidence he pulls out of some place long buried. From days when you had to stand straight and silent no matter what. Forces his legs to move. The impact of each step jarring his side and aching head sends nausea roiling through him. He's focusing so hard on staying upright that he's not really paying attention to where he's going. Stumbles into a few other people that all snap at him in indignation. But Tubbo's so out of it, he just mumbles incoherent sounds in apology, hoping they'll move on without blasters needing to be drawn. After the third or fourth time, though, a heavy weight settles around his shoulders and he's tugged into something soft. And Tubbo goes along like a rag doll, rubs his face absently into the silken texture, and feels it rumble through him as Rambu mumbles, Ancients, you're a wreck. You're a wreck, he slurs back petulantly, thudding his head into Rambu's side in retaliation, which turns out to be a bad idea and sends white bursts of light blooming across his field of vision, has Tubbo relying more heavily on Rambu to stay vertical. His fever must be picking up, because Tubbo feels like in between one blink and the next, they're back at the hangar. Rambu more or less dragging him up the cargo ramp at this point. The pain that's flaring out from his blaster wound feels like it's settling in other places in his body, leaking down in between his bones, making his joints ache and grind together like unoiled pistons. There isn't a single point on Tubbo's body that doesn't hurt, 
and he stands at the base of the ladder, looking up, with a sense of horror crowding in his chest. Here's Rambu come up behind him, and grits his teeth, gets started on the first few rungs. He isn't even halfway up, when something pulls, very, very, very wrong, and it's like getting shot all over again. Agony, exploding out from his side, and the sensation ripping through him is enough to make Tubbo lose his grip on the ladder. He falls back with a yell, wings snapping open automatically, but they're sluggish, responding to his frantic thoughts. And Tubbo's sure he's going to hit the floor hard, when arms catch him unexpectedly. Accidentally digging in too sharply around his side as they attempt to slow his fall. Tubbo howls as red-hot fire races up his skin, crawls like lightning through his nerves, twists his head to the side and buries his face in the freezing crook of Ranbu's neck, breathing out harshly through his mouth as Ranbu stumbles under his weight, unintentionally grabbing Tubbo too tight again, and he whimpers at the sickly burn that bleeds out at the touch. What in the... Uh, are you okay? I... what even... Rambu is stammering as he tries to lower Tubbo to the ground as delicately as possible, arms shaking with either nerves or fatigue. Uh, are you feeling lightheaded? Is... is... what's... what's wrong? What hurts? Hmm... aside. Tubbo pants out, reaching back with one trembling hand to help guide Ranbu, slumps over onto the relieving chill of the cargo base floor once he's let go presses his burning forehead into the plastisteel and sighs in relief. Your side? Rambu repeats incredulously, and Tubbo can feel him settle down next to him, talking mostly to himself, while Tubbo attempts to not pass out. But that doesn't make sense. Why would an illness... Unless it's... Y you mean like... Tubbo whines in the back of his throat when Rambu's hands start digging at him, Flip him until he's lying on his back and ruck his clothes up, hears him hiss out when he presumably sees the mottled skin on his torso. When did this happen? Uh, a few weeks ago? Tubbo mumbles, wincing at the shockingly cold fingers feeling around the skin on his side, the careful claws peeling the edge of the med patch back. Shoot out on Joro. Uh, it's cold. Can you not... Ancients of the deep! I... When's the last time you cleaned this? Rambu's voice is too loud, clamoring harshly in Tubbo's ears, and he tries to squirm away, but Rambu's got a death grip on him. Hey, Tubbo, stop, you insufferable... I... Where's your med kit? This stair is somewhere, I don't know. Tubbo responds sluggishly really wants to be left alone to sleep this off. That's all he needs. A few hours of rest and he'll be better. Rambu's just theatrical and overdramatic, especially when he shakes Tubbo's shoulders and demands a better answer. And Tubbo groans. Fucking, I don't know. Stop being so loud, fucking piss ass. Rambu makes a series of incomprehensible noises in Ender that are clearly swears but finally gets up and leaves Tubbo alone, his boots clinging on the ladder rungs as he heads topside. It's blissfully quiet in the hold now, and Tubbo rolls over gingerly with a sigh, cradles his head in his arms, and rides out the waves of pain that sweep through him like the tides, hazy, hot blanket of a fever high draping over his mind. His thoughts are muddled, Dreams and memories blurring together as he drifts at the edge of sleep, sees the searing light of a supernova behind his closed lids. But if he looks close enough, he can pick out a wicked smile, glasses catching and flashing in the light as a hand holds out a match to him. There can be no half-measures. Tubbo jolts awake when something heavy thumps down onto the floor, cracks bleary eyes open, and thinks he's still half-asleep seeing the mattress laying on the floor of the cargo hold, a pillow and blankets falling down after it. A plastic box is thrown down a second later, bouncing on the mattress and rattling the contents inside, and Tubbo can only watch in delirious confusion as Ranbu follows it, landing on his feet soundlessly, 
begins jerking the mattress around until he's satisfied with it laying flat. He pads over to Tubbo, who stares at his bare feet like an idiot. Only thought in his head that either Ender don't have claws on their toes, or that they trim them to wear shoes. He's so dark, Tubbo thinks incoherently, giggling a little at the next thought that melts into his head like the slow drip of metal liquefying in intense heat. Does he ever lose himself at night? Slips away in the dark. Bye-bye, boo-boy. Crouching down beside him, Rambu doesn't even say anything before snaking his arms under Tubbo. Tries to be careful lifting him up, but the movement drags at all the aching points on his body, and Tubbo keens in the back of his throat. What are you... What are you... Stop. I was fine and way... You have a serious infection in that wound, and don't need to be sleeping on the cold, dirty floor. Rambu tells him, in a no-nonsense voice, moving unsteadily across to where the mattress is, sets him down like he's something breakable, and Tebo protests weakly. I'm fine. It's healing okay. I, I just need a little sleep, that's all. It is not healing okay. Rambu interrupts him curtly, turning to grab the med kit and begins rummaging around in it. It is infected, and horribly so. At this point, I would be surprised if the infection hasn't spread to your bloodstream. What? N no, there's no way. Panic makes his heart seize in his chest, and Tubbo's arms shake under him where he's propped himself up, terror curling in his body and freezing everything it touches where he was burning up just a second ago. Tubbo's not a coward, goes into firefights with determination burning in his fingers, but there are a few things that'll send him over the edge of hysteria like nothing else, and one of those is sickness. Infection. The thought of his body wasting away around him, and his heart jackhammers under his ribs like it's trying to escape. You... Yeah. You're fucking with me. Tubbo stammers, and scoots back on the mattress like he's going to make a break for it. But what would he even be running from? His wound's going to go with him. There's no way out. You're stuck. You're trapped. Can't breathe. Can't think. You... you... you don't know what you're talking about. Rambus found what he's looking for, turns back around with a few bottles and some gauze in his hands. Says, surprisingly even, when he meets Tubbo's eyes. I do, actually. And I need to flush that wound now, or you're going to get sepsis. Sepsis? Tubbo parrots back at a whisper, chest heaving like there's not enough air in here. And there is. He can breathe. He's fine. But he's not. He's not. He's not. He can't breathe. Can't think. There's chemical smoke everywhere and gas in his lungs, and every inhale brings those swirling embers inside, threatening to ignite what's left, burn him up from the inside out, no half measures. Tabo heaves in panic, walls closing in around him. This is what has to be done. He's trapped, no way out. What does he do? Can't escape. Help. He needs help. Do it. No one's there. He's alone. Queens, help him. He needs something. Someone. Anyone. Help. Something chilly is touching his face, and Tubbo presses into it wildly, the billowing fire in his mind overrun with the cold kiss of bulkheads under his hands, the dark velvet of open space, engines humming their otherworldly songs around him. And he can breathe. He can think. Shudders out an exhale, and is surprised when smoke doesn't go with it. Listen to me. I need you to take deep breaths, got it? In, one, two. Out, one, two. Can you do that? Rambu says firmly, and Tebo can do that. He knows how to do that. Sucks in one tremulous inhale, lets it sit aching in his lungs for two counts, and then lets it out. In, one, two. You're fine, it's okay. Out, one, two. You're not there. You're far away. You're safe. In, one, two. You can get out. You're not trapped. Out, one, two. Whole universe at your fingertips. In, one, two. Tabo breathes out slowly, 
sagging forward into what he can now tell are hands on his face. Everything about him feeling sticky and achy and wrung out, and he shivers at the way nerves curdle his insides. And Rambu jolts, dropping his hands quickly. S sorry I, I am... Um, I know I'm probably really cold. I don't mind. Tippo mumbles without thinking, teeth chattering together as another spasm racks his body and he swallows past the foul taste in his mouth. Fever making him lightheaded and more emotional than he normally is. Sniffs loudly in the quiet of the hold. Is it... Am I gonna be... Okay. Rambu hesitates, ears flicking down as his eyes dart to the side, and Tubbo can't stop the wet sob that tumbles out of his mouth. Images of rotting decay spreading out from his side and consuming him whole, infesting his mind, presses trembling fingers into his temples and stammers. Fuck. I I'm so stupid. Queens, I just... And now I... Oh, fuck me. I'm such a fucking idiot. What do I, I do? What do I do? Hey, stop. It's it's going to be okay. Rambu says quickly and ducks into Tebo's line of sight, pinning him with his mismatched eyes, a fierce, determined light glowing from them. I'm going to take care of it. I, I won't let anything happen to you, I promise. Inhales, catching around the tears in his throat. Tebo scrubs a hand across his face, too strung out and exhausted to be self-conscious over it. You promise? Yes, but it's going to get worse before it gets better. Rambu grimaces at him guiltily, like he actually cares. Isn't just doing this so he's stuck here with no ride home? Hesitates before reaching a hand out and wrapping it lightly around one of Tubbo's forearms. You just have to trust me, okay? How can he even ask that? They don't know each other. But you kind of do, a voice whispers at the back of Tubbo's head. You know he's an ass, that he's smart, loves the universe with the same searing infinity as you, isn't as spoiled as you thought, is a hard worker, and doesn't complain when it matters. You know that he trusted you to get you both safely away from Osiren. And that's what does it. Has Tubbo nodding his head jerkily as he whispers, Okay. He lies back, like Rambu asks, and fists a towel in his mouth, tries to keep his whimpering to a minimum as Rambu snips the sutures open, digs days' worth of grime out of his wound, slow, methodical movements that drag like searing fire up Tubbo's side, has his vision blacking out around the edges. Queens, it hurts. It hurts so much. The slow scrape of gauze against his abused flesh, drawing out fine bits of sand that dig like glass into his skin. And Rambu's trying to be careful, stops when Tubbo begs him to, lets him catch his breath before starting again, but he's absolutely merciless in finding every speck of dirt and removing it from Tubbo's side. When he feels Rambu lean back, Tubbo sighs in relief, thinking the worst of it's over. And then there's one hand forcing his shoulder firmly into the mattress while Rambu offers a quick, sorry, his other pouring what feels like actual fire into the open wound. Tubbo screams, thrashing in his hold like a wild animal, but Rambu's stronger than he looks, keeps him pinned down as he disinfects the gash, and Tubbo must pass out from the pain, comes back around panting hard on the mattress, eyes itchy from dried tears. His entire left side feels like it's being slow-roasted, achy hot sensation of fire dragging over his skin, a dull throbbing from the area around the wound itself where Rambu sewed him back up. The fever drags him back into semi-consciousness, strange, half-remembered dreams passing through his head, fading in and out along with the agony pulsing through his body. Everything's hazy and wrong, tinted with nausea and a growing paranoia, 
and it feels like Tubbo's rocking on the surface of a sticky hot sea, sour taste of bile in his mouth that he can't seem to swallow past, whimpers in the back of his throat because he's miserable and scared. A hand lightly brushes sweaty hair out of his eyes, and he deliriously thinks it's his mother, sees her standing so clearly in the kitchen with her gossamer wings and curly antenna, chases after the touch while mumbling in their native tongue, Amma, I don't feel good. Her hand is gone, lightning fast, and he nudges his head around trying to find it, wants her to card fingers through his hair, scratch around the base of his antenna like she'd do when he stayed home from school sick, humming gentle songs that distracted him from how horrible he felt. Amma, please. Tebo begs when her hands won't come back to him, curls up tighter and holds on to himself. I don't feel good, Amma. Amma. Hesitantly, weirdly reluctant, her hands settle on his head gently, fingers barely dragging through his hair and Tubbo sighs, snuffling wetly as he tips his head further into her touch. Amma. Amma. I'm not whoever you think I am. A voice says that doesn't belong to his mother, but the hands don't stop, dragging icy trails across Tubbo's scalp, like the chilly sweep of comets through space. And I know it, um, probably doesn't mean much, but, but I'm here, for all that's worth. And as Tubbo drifts off into a muddled sleep, lulled by the cold hands moving through his hair, teasing his mind out to float somewhere in the relieving calm of deep space, helping him forget the throbbing pain his body is consumed by. He has a hazy thought that it's worth a lot not being alone right now. An excerpt from the Declassified Galactic Survival Guide In this day and age, Anwil is considered one of the crown jewels in the Sun Empire's crown, and its reigning king enjoys unprecedented sway in the judicial halls on Nerox, pushes policies that will better their own planet and the never-ending stream of wealth that floods into their coffers faster than their local sun can rotate. It is often joked about, but meant very sincerely that there are two rulers of the Sun Empire, the Neroxan Sun Emperor and the End King of Voidfall. And if it were any other planet... The Emperor would have wiped these notions clear from existence. But it's Anwil, the most unsensible place in the universe that has enough destructive power contained in small blue rockets to level the entire Imperial fleet if they felt like it. Unfortunately, but not unsurprisingly, this dual pseudo-rulership helped spawn one of the most toxic court environments currently in existence only outpaced by the now-ended Plukin dynasty from Jila, which had so many assassinations and poisonings people are still unsure who was ever actually in the royal court. While certainly less enthusiastic than the Plukins, the Enderian royal court is no less deadly. On average sees an assassination or murder plot weekly, if not daily, as courtiers vie for favours with the king, which in turn earns them favours in the wider Sun Empire a deadly game of tit-for-tat that has only gotten more aggressive at Anwil's continually increasing prosperity. The overall experience of growing up in Voidfall's court has spawned generations of the most cagey, secretive beings in existence, and it's said that the first thing young Ender nobles are taught, above walking even, is the art of lying, and the best way to hide daggers inconspicuously on their person which makes dealing with any Ender nobility an absolute nightmare, because everything they do cannot be taken at face value, is probably part of some larger plot to gain the upper hand in the situation, and your author can attest to that fact, because, after meeting several Ender diplomats and nobility that survived to adulthood, it is next to impossible to know where you stand with them, and they'll never, even under pain of death, tell you.